what's going on, y'all? Uh, this is uh, the Black Love Men's Roundtable. My name is Belief, and I want the gentlemen at the table to introduce themselves. Kariga, why don't you go ahead and start? Peace, good people. I'm Kariga Bailey, angel father, author, um, Black Love practitioner. I don't know how I'm supposed to follow it. <laughs> Marcus Tanksley, uh, y'all know me as Marcus on the gram or Tank. I'm a father, a husband, social media influencer. What's up, y'all? My name is Lawrence Robinson. I'm an actor, father. Yeah. <laughs> What's up, guys? My name is Anthony Clark. I'm a certified life and love coach and an author. Yeah, so today we're going to be discussing uh, mental health, um, physical health, and I just want you guys to tell me, and anybody can start, I want you to tell me when you recognized uh, that you needed help, right? You were at your lowest, um, and I want you to tell me maybe who is the one that helped you recognize that? Um, I'll go ahead and start. So there was a period of time where, so I had, was, had moved to California. I'm out here working my way up, you know, the corporate ladder. And then my last job that I had, um, I was striving for a particular position. Really, really wanted to get there. So I ended up getting this position and right, let me see, uh, Year before I got this position, my dad passed. Oh. Um, so I'm in this position, in a new position, still dealing with that, not really realizing it. On top of being in a position where, you know, in, up until that point, you know, 18 years before I was a man, I knew exactly what to do. Mm -hmm. I'm in this position because of my experience. However, in this particular uh, job, this field, I'm not, I don't know what is, what's going on. I'm still learning everything. So I'm like green again. I'm like, I ain't been green for 18 years. What is this? So going through that, then I'll fast forward a little bit. I had a conversation one day. I was uh, met a guy who had been in this position for quite quite some time. I was leaving work, came up on him. And he's I'm like, hey, how's it going? You know, let, let me get some feedback from him. I've been I, at this time. It was probably like six months in. Yeah, maybe a year. And you know, he's telling me everything about how his day went, how his last couple of weeks have gone, and what the forecast is for the next couple of weeks. And as he's talking, I'm realizing. There is no way in hell I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. There is no way. So coming to that realization in that moment, in that conversation, driving home, having that epiphany, still the lingering effect of losing my dad. And then uh, in the middle of this, I'm, you know, we still doing our podcast, me and my wife and everything, vlogging and everything. And I look back, fast forwarding, you know, till la up until through last year, realized I was extremely depressed I was going through it. And I thought I was just stressed because of work. Like, I lost a whole lot of weight. Yeah. I, was, I, I'm, I usually, I'm between 220 and 240. Right now, I'm like 245. I was down to barely 200 pounds. Mm -hmm. And on me, on my frame, going back and look at it, you can tell. Like, my face is shrunken down. And I told my wife, I was like, you, I was depressed right here. I was mm -hmm. looking at a video. I was like, look at my face. I don't even look healthy. Yeah. And she, you know, they don't see that. Like, oh, you always look good, babe. Like, man, just <laughs> shut up. That ain't what I'm talking about. Right? <laughs> I'm over here, like, look at me right here. So yeah. realizing that, it was like um, I had that trauma of, it was like almost like a trauma of looking back at the past and was like, dang, I went through that and I didn't even realize it. Uh, did, did, was it was it the fact that it disrupted your purpose? It, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, as you know, a lot of men have this whole mindset, you know, a lot of us, our career is us. That defines mm -hmm. us, yeah. what we bring to the table. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and me being in this position, you know, money's okay and everything, but being in this and it's just like, but if I don't want to do this, what am I going to do with my life? Okay. I got, a fan, I got four kids. I got a wife. I got mortgage. I got bills. It's mm -hmm. like I support all of this. My wife is over here. People see her as the mogul. I'm the foundation of that. Like, yeah. wow. I'm stable. This is what I do. Yes. I've done this for 20 years. This, this is me. And this ain't what I want to do. And now it's gone. And my heart is not in it. So that's when, um, yeah, it's gone. Like, the thrill was gone. And I was just like, what? Mm. So it was like a hard conversation I had with myself. But then I realized, I hope I'm not fast forwarding it, but no. uh, I realized every single time I've made an elevation in my career, an elevation in life, God, was always the forefront of that. And he would always, I realized he always makes me uncomfortable enough to move, so I move myself. Amen. It ain't like I pray for it and God's like, oh, here you go. Yeah. He's like, no, God's like, no, I'm gonna make you uncomfortable enough to where you can do this and you end up doing this yourself. I'm gonna push you out of that place you don't wanna be in. Mm. And that's what he was doing. Mm. And that was what, fast forward now, that's what moved me to retire from my nine to five last, uh, last year in May and work for me and my wife full time. 
Yeah. So now self-employed. But I ended up going through all that because I never would have stepped away from my nine to five because that's what I do. You know, that hands on, I, I, you know, structural and tech, I do all that stuff all day. But did I enjoy it? No, it was just, I was just good at it. Yeah. 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 Can, I, can, I, can I just, uh, speaking of purpose, right, I just kind of wanted to table it to Anthony because it seems like all the things throughout your life has kind of culminated to the moment where you and your wife got together and now you guys are life coaches, right? right. It's because you've had a very interesting story. Yeah, you could have life if you right. want to be a life coach. Exactly. Life. Yeah. <laughs> so can you tell me about that point where you kind of reached that, that low point and you were like, <clears throat> something has to change at this moment? So, so for me, there were a couple of moments like that in my life. So I had like multiple breakdowns. Well, I like to call them catharsis sis, that I went through. The first one was I moved to California, I played sports, and I moved from Brooklyn to California to go to college at 17. And immediately I met my college girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And we moved in together, and I saw that we weren't compatible, but I stuck with it anyway. Um, but we started fighting like cats and dogs, cats and dogs, we were both stubborn. And so we broke up, we were doing an ex-sex, make up, break up, make up, break up, and she said she was pregnant with twin boys. At the time, I had an opportunity to play pro basketball in Peru and pro baseball with the Brewers, double-A baseball. So I was ready to go to camp, and she comes back and goes, I'm pregnant. And even though we weren't connected, my father wasn't there for me, so I'm like, I'm always going to be there for my kids, even though I, know, I feel like I shouldn't be with her, so I married her anyway. So in the process, I had to give up the sports because she needed help right then and there, so I couldn't report to, to camp. Mm. So um, to make a long story short, I married her, the twins were born, um, named after me. The first three years, we just fought me and her, like still like cats and dogs, and it just hit rock bottom. It was like, this, this ain't gonna work. Then I found out that I wasn't the biological father after all of that. So here I am in my 20s, like 21, 20, about 20, 23 at the time. Lost the marriage, athletic career, my whole future, so it was like rock bottom. Yeah. I even thought about killing myself at different points. Mm -hmm. But then my spirit was like, you know what? This could be a blessing. This could be an opportunity for you. But in order for you to, to take advantage of it, you got to get your shit together. Mm -hmm. You got to stop blaming everybody else and start looking at yourself. Yeah. And so I started doing my inner work. OK, so what does that look like? Because a lot of people say inner work, inner work, but I don't know what be working in her. You know what I'm saying? You got to tell me what that means. My inner work was to be honest with myself and to look at how I was, how I thought, and to start questioning, is this really benefiting me? Why am I being like this? Why do I act like this? Mm -hmm. And the tendency for a lot of people is to be like, well, that's just the way I am. But I knew if I stay the way I am, I'm not gonna get to where I wanna be. Mm -hmm. yeah, man. So I always say like, to go there, you gotta grow there. You're on this level, you're always trying to get to high levels of understanding, enlightenment, wealth, you name it. So how are you gonna get to those other levels? They ain't gonna come to you, you gotta go to it. So I got to expand and get out of my old way of thinking and being. Mm -hmm. And so I recreated myself. And I describe it like, and this connects to even a second trauma, so I'm going to combine them together. I went into the Department of Corrections as a state correction officer. And I was involved in a shooting. And after that shooting, I experienced post-traumatic stress. So now it goes back to the inner work. How am I going to get out of this? The same way with the marriage. I mean, with that, now the shooting. So I compare it to a pantry cabinet. And everything in that pantry cabinet has been there throughout my entire life. The salt shaking. Them. These are all my beliefs, all the things I was programmed to be and this and that. But it wasn't working for me. Mm -hmm. But I didn't really realize it. Then one day, there's this traumatic event. The marriage, the divorce, the shooting, where there's an earthquake and everything gets knocked over. Mm -hmm. And so that's the breakdown. Now you lose your identity. Who am I? Like you, it forced me, Absolutely. that catharsis. The system breaks down when it takes too much pressure. Mm -hmm. Eventually it's gonna break down. But it breaks down to give you an opportunity to rebuild it back even better. So with my catharsis, it was like, okay, what most people try to do is to go back to what they were. Mm -hmm. So let me put the stuff back in here, but you're gonna get the same life again. So I was like, you know what? No, this is a great opportunity. I have the opportunity now to create the life I wanna live. Mm -hmm. I wanna be who I want to be, not because of what other people expect of me. I'm going to be my true self. I'm going to spirit. Mm. 
within. Yeah. So that connection, because that's the internal guidance system where everything you need, all the answers, it's going to come from there. God, whatever name you want to call it. Mm -hmm. So most people are trying to get it out there. It's not out there. There's nothing out there. Right. Out there. It's in here. Mm. So if you don't go within, you will go without. Mm -hmm. Guarantee you. I like that. So what I started doing was, was I started putting this pantry back. I wasn't trying to recreate the same one. I wanted to create a pantry that I loved, a pantry that I was proud of. And so I'm putting stuff back, like, what is this? Dude, this shit ain't good. I don't need that. Let me throw it out of the way. What right, is this? Right, oh, right. this is, oh, I don't need that. What do I want there? I want this there. I want that there. So when I was done, I rebuilt this amazing pantry cabinet, an amazing life that I loved. And so the marriage and that, I did the same thing with each situation. And I came back better and stronger. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. You want to add, Lawrence? I mean, I ain't gonna never look at a pantry ever the same again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna be looking at the seasonings yeah, like, well, you ain't got no sage in here. Which one is from Philly? Yeah. Which season is from New York? He's in the old bay at. I'm gonna right? be looking yeah. at all my seasonings, looking at all, like, naming all the trauma. <laughs> yeah. Turmeric, huh? Okay. <laughs> I don't even like turmeric. <laughs> man, that was good, man. I'm triggered. I ain't gonna hold you. I'm triggered, man. Um, because, like, I'm so similar to both of you guys. It's like, as far as I had to recreate myself every time I moved to a different city, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm from Philly, born and raised, but then I had to move to New York City. You got to recreate yourself, but you going to go home. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Then moving to LA, it was the same thing. And what was really uh, hard for me was, you know, being a full-time actor and believing that this is what I wanted to do with myself. And it was my dream. Mm -hmm. I had to 100% commit to that. And with 100% committing to acting is dealing with financial struggle. Because if you in acting class, you gonna miss work. But if you don't work, you gonna miss acting class. So it's like, you gotta find that balance. And finding that balance is the hardest thing when it becomes a, being an actor. Mm. Like, it's the hardest thing because you just gotta find that, you gotta be able to figure out uh, which is more, I, uh, mm. It's like, I want to say, what, what is more important? Yeah, what is more important at the time? Mm -hmm. And, of course, she, she always comes to my mind. Uh, my acting coach, my big sis, you know, Tasha Smith, she's going to come to my mind. Because and when I got to L.A., her being my coach, she would always say to me, you have to find a way to sustain yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You have to find a way. And she would always say that to me. And when you broke, it's like, I ain't trying to hear that. Yeah, like, I'm surviving. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? And then being so close to somebody like that, you know, people think that that was a relationship that was, you know, that that I was born into. Like, no, that was, you know, I, that was something that God gave me when I moved here. Mm -hmm. But um, that's what I was doing before I even got here. That's what I was doing in New York. I was trying to find a way to sustain myself. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I ever knew how to put a word to it. But of course she does. You know what I'm saying? So the reality is, um, every time when it came to uh, recreate myself, I hit rock bottom. And hitting rock bottom is not being able to pay your rent, not being able to pay your bills. And when I hit rock bottom, I always go to God. Mm -hmm. I go to God. But I ain't, I've never learned how to go to God until I moved to L.A. and I went to One Church L.A. with... TD, I mean, Sarah Jakes Roberts and Tori Roberts. That's when I learned, like, you know, it was just different going to that church. That mm -hmm. church showed me, you know, when people say, oh, that's the Hollywood church, call it what you want, because that, that church feeds me. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And that church feeds me because it's relatable. It's not judgmental. It's just, like, the truth of, like, yo, like, you know, you Sarah won't get up there and talk about auditions. Yeah. And she, ain't, she not an actress, but she know what we going through. Yeah. Um, and... Yeah, man. It's just about, like, just really going back to God. That's always where I lead. That's where I always where I go. And, and I think it's, um, it's something beautiful about being able to lean on a community. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I, I know, Kariga, like, you're, I mean, you're one of them people that have called me, and even if I don't answer, like, I'm like, man, you know what I'm saying? Like, I know you're calling me to a community and pulling me to a place where, um, you believe better, right? Mm -hmm. you, you know, about the people that you wanna interact with. But I think it's because, and I'm, you could correct me if I'm wrong, but your foundation, you know, with your family and having such a, a close-knit community with your brothers, and now, um, you know, to see how you and your wife, you know what I mean, collaborating mm -hmm. the music and all this stuff, can you add to this conversation? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm listening deeply, uh, processing. And I'm, I'm looking at, like, 
men on different intersections of life than I'm at. So I'm grateful for the conversation, but I'm also assessing myself within the cipher. Um, and when he started talking about that pantry, I was like, what made him choose the pantry? It's uh -huh. such an interesting place, right? And I do exercise of taking inventory, but my wife would love for me to take better care of the pantry, uh -huh. right? I know mm -hmm. it, and I try. Um, but it really made me look at him on an intersection like, damn, <laughs> homie taking care of the pantry. At least the pantry's organized. Figuratively and literally, though, but like living in the partnership. Um, and that, that place in life, Marcus, when you're talking about like, you know, being in a career X amount of years and just looking at it like, yo, this is it's different now. Mm -hmm. Or whether recreating yourself and finding that rock bottom and evolving and finding that rock bottom and finding God. And I'm listening to the conversation and the question, um, and I'm trying to ask myself, like, damn, when is it? When was it? Uh, yeah. Where am I now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, I'm certainly in a mind state of abundance. I'm not at rock bottom. But the blows that took me to the deepest waters, um, it, it almost felt like I could not find rock bottom. Rock bottom would have been stable ground. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's deep. Rock bottom would have been a certain turning point. I've been in the open. Um, I've been in the deep waters, posturing myself for um, seeing different, um, seeing abundance, like training my mind mm -hmm. to be the first mind that sees abundance and calls abundance rather than being the first voice that creates doubt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But. Mm -hmm. The doubts come from lived experiences. The doubts come from, you know, um, losing my brother in 2014, uh, gun violence, and, and the way that is inter the way that exists around us so much. Yeah. But my intersection of life is I'm not far from it. And also looking at like, in a recent conversation, uh, I finally was able to articulate that. Um, you can't just address me by any one situation that's happened to me. Wow. You, you'll have to address me or have a conversation with me about what has happened to me, but you also must address me as a man that's kept going. Mm -hmm. It's in my keep going. That's where you find way more about my, my faith, my intimacy, and really who God is in my life. It's not in my bottom moments. It's in the tenacity, the will to keep going, to keep striving. And it's not a, like, a, it's not like a, it's not like bullish either. Sometimes it's just like this gentle, like relentless incrementalism, but I can't stay here. So when Anthony said, but I, I can't stay here, mm -hmm. this is an invitation to create something new, uh, meet myself a new way. But that does mean that Perhaps everything you once was familiar with will no longer be. Who am I outside of this experience? Wow. So I think I'm asking myself that question real time, real life. Mm -hmm. And I am framing the habits of mind to tell myself, like, you can't pray with a double mind. Mm -hmm. So my mind has to be solid even when I'm praying to God. If I'm praying with doubt, I'm the double-minded person in the prayer. Mm -hmm. Amen. So, I train myself to remember what is true and then submit myself in that um, alignment with prayer. But when, you're, when it's done, whether you're in your prayer closet on your knees or just driving and talking real life, I had to situate my mind on abundance, not the losses that have happened to me, but they have happened, bro. They have happened, yeah. happened, happened. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think the scariest part about what you're saying is that you don't want to believe that you're going to have to get used to the loss, right? And so it's a it's constant, right? And you're like, oh, grief is something that I have to invite in and that ultimately I don't want it to be here long, but I have to make it comfortable because I will lose again. Mm -hmm. I will continue to lose again. So this is a roommate that lives with me now, yeah. that yeah. has residency in my home, you yeah. know? Um, and not only that, as we're talking about the pantry, mm -hmm. right? You got people coming up to you saying, I'm hungry. Mm -hmm. I need you to, whatever you got in that pantry, I need you to, I need you to support me mm -hmm. with that. 
with whatever you got up in there. And even if you're in the middle of a rock bottom, you know, breakdown and everything's off the shelves, the skill of black men is to create with nothing. Mm -hmm. We have nothing in the pantry, yes. yet we're still supposed to provide yes. and fight against all of the external things that are coming at us. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So in doing all of that, right, and then, right, we don't, nobody wants to hear about it. <laughs> we don't want to hear you complain. That's inconvenient. Mm -hmm. Give me what I asked for. And I'm not saying that that is the, the, the majority of, of our relationships, right. but we are not cared for, right? Um, therefore, we don't know to care for ourselves well. I was just thinking, though, right? about this, you're saying like we're not cared for, but sometimes I feel like we put more on ourselves than others do. Right, all we're seeing is that we are here to produce something. Mm -hmm. Right. We are what we do. Yeah. And yeah. so when you have your foundation shaken, um, you have your uh, your identity and your purpose moved. Yeah. Uh, that place looks like depression. And that is what I'm saying is like, it's OK. You know what I'm saying? Like, I need everyone to know that it's OK. Right. To be at the lowest point and just sit, you know, I look back at my childhood and all the traumas and all the deaths and the fact that I didn't expect to live to be 17 growing up in Brooklyn, um, I'm just, same drama, chaos, chaos. Broken heart, kids lost, this, the, the shootings, this. If you could change any of that, I would not change any of it. Because it made me who I am. Mm -hmm. And in life, you're gonna have, that's part of life. Nobody's gonna come to life and have everything perfect. Right. So you're gonna have challenges. And it's how you overcome those challenges and what's gonna make the difference is your perspective on it. And so, the life that I live now, I love the life that I live now. But it's because those experiences, those traumas, those negative experiences, those curses, I turned them into blessings. And when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. So it all comes from perspective. Wow. So, so uh, how are we changing our perspectives, though? Right? Is it a, is it a choice? Like, is this something that we we are we are hypnotizing ourselves? Are we doing daily affirmations? Like, what uh, it, well, is it? One thing that I always is, I read this on those years ago, but it's that's it's the saying: pain is inevitable, misery is optional. Mm. So I can choose to to dwell in this, and and. Some people need to. You need maybe you need to sit there and take it in and realize where you're at, but you have to keep going. Mm -hmm. you, and that that's where the misery will come in. If if you're in that point longer than what you need to be, yeah. And it's like you, you talk mm -hmm. about like mm -hmm. falling or mm -hmm. hitting rock bottom. Mm -hmm. Physically, if you jump from that ledge and jump down, there's going to be a period of time where your legs grab you. And then you're eventually going to have to come back up. You can't sit in that squat position forever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's that. Um, d dealing with that, being in that moment of, all right, this is where it's at, this is awful, and then figuring out how to stand back up and climb back up the steps. Yeah. Um, yeah. How we do that, ama amazingly, as black men, is like we are the best at doing it. Because mm -hmm. it's like, you know, we you know, talk about you know, mental health and everything and wanting to reach out for help or not knowing to reach out for help. And this is like, you know, they may be a shunned upon. Oh, you you know, you're seeking help, you're going to therapy. It's like if you broke your leg, you're gonna walk around with a broken leg, or you're gonna go to the doctor and get a crutch and get mm -hmm. a cast. Mm -hmm. And this is like, as black men, some of us are born injured. Uh -huh. You know, mentally. In the in be, living in the United States, that's an injury uh -huh. already coming True. out of the blocks. So it's like there's nothing wrong with seeking that help or real, constantly studying yourself. Right now, I feel like I'm great, but are there th some things that I could work on to help me better? You know, you talked about, you know, coming out stronger. It's like when you tear something, you break a bone, a lot of times that bone heals stronger, but yeah. you gotta let it heal. You gotta get help for that healing to happen, mm -hmm. to come back stronger. That most of us uh, who have experienced therapy have really experienced privilege, right? Mm -hmm. Because we could afford mm -hmm. the help, right, that we need. Um, my therapist told me, uh, you know, that uh, no one is going to need me more than I need me, right? And um, I didn't really understood that because I didn't really understand it because I was like, man, like, 
everybody needs me, right? Everyone I know, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, like I'm trying to lift up fatherhood for the generation, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, everybody need what I got, you know what yeah. I mean? And he's like, no, but you need you more, you know? And so if I know that, then I know I need, not only do I need myself, is I need, I need him, but I also need a couple people that need me, right? A couple young men that I could be teaching just these little things are like, yo, check in with this person, man. Like, don't hold on to that too long. You're gonna have to have this conversation, right? And so that, that, that old proverb, like, each one teach one, that is a real thing that I feel like we all should be carrying. You know what I'm saying? I think so, that's a blessing of fatherhood, though. Right. Because, you know, once I had my son and, like, seeing him grow up, it made me realize that it wasn't just about me anymore. Mm -hmm. Because we keep talking about, you know, how to get, you know, fix ourselves and, you know, get rock bottom or realizing. But a lot of people, especially where I'm from, they don't think nothing is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They don't think nothing is wrong, you know what I'm saying? And they go through their whole life not even having a clue. They think that depression is normal. Yeah. yeah. So it's like having a kid, that's when you realize, I know for me, that it's like, all right, you know, you got another responsibility that's not just yourself. And then you start realizing, like, yo, I got to change these things about me in order to show him better. So I think being a black dad is just, like, the biggest gift that we can receive as black men. Yeah. It's, it's like they say a fish doesn't know he's in water until he gets out of water. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they don't know that they're in that situation because that's the norm. Right. And that's been the father's norm in generations and generations. And it's like society in our community they gave us this template to live by. And they said, okay, here's how you should think, act, and be in all of these situations. And if you live up to this template that we created for you, then we're gonna give you kudos. You're gonna get respect and props in the community. If you don't, then you're gonna get ridiculed and you're gonna get dissed. So, and if you see anybody else doing it, ridicule and diss them. So it scares us into living into this template. Mm -hmm. But that template doesn't serve us. That template actually works against us. And so the key is for us to break that template and go, I'm not living by the template. It goes back to the pantry. Yeah. I'm going to recreate it, my own template, mm, yeah. and not get stuck in this. The other part that youngsters need to hear in the game is it's all temporary. The naysayers are temporary, mm -hmm. right? The template is temporary. The naysayers are temporary. The props are temporary. Yeah. The kudos are temporary. Right. It's all temporary because you can't do all your growth in that one setting, mm -hmm. right? You'll have to experience the discomfort of newness or... Uh, trying again. Um, this idea, though, that like the hood, like like there, nothing's wrong with it. I think it's um. I think innately every human being knows something is wrong with it. Yeah, so I agree. I wonder I agree. what happens to our thinking when we don't think we have the capacity to change it, mm -hmm. right? Because if we're really talking and being honest, are really around the construct, the whether whatever whatever ails us. But let's just say the violence. With all my might, love, and heart, I can say something from the depths of my heart and it does not solve the problem grand scale. It may make a difference in that instance. Yeah. Now, that's where the each one teach one comes, right? But we have to be as persistent about um, creating the world we desire mm. as, as the problem is persistent about existing. So this conversation is one iteration. We need another one that's happening right on the corner. We need another one that's happening in Philly or whatever, right? Yeah. We need these things to happen um, inside these spaces and outside these spaces. Mm -hmm. Because especially with concerning grief and that, you know, that roommate we all have and like what I've understood deeply about grief is that like grief is not just like a, a thing to get back to, but it like say if you try to busy it away or be productive away, like you pass the time, you don't pass the grief. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. So the time is going. But the grief you must spend intimate time with, mm -hmm. it grows you, it evolves you. And it's so uncomfortable. I know God to be in our discomfort, in our grief, in our restarts, um, and in the in the template. All of those things they're just they're just temporary, and unlocking it so more young young folks get to see that sooner, um, take the jump sooner, take the risk sooner. Amen. Right? It's just like um, that's the imperative part. I think like mental health is this. I did, there's this clicking top clock, and that clock is fake too. Yeah. It's temporary. Yeah. There is grace, but we don't know how to see it because you know, that clock is really loud. Wow. All right. Yo, so this has been the Black Love Men's Roundtable. Thank you guys so much for peeping our conversation. 
on mental health. Uh, my name is Belief. We got Kariga, we got Marcus, Lawrence, and Anthony. Uh, make sure you guys follow Black Love and uh, stay tuned for the next one. Peace.